This show is brought to you by Slice on Broadway. Supporting Pittsburgh podcasting with the perfect pepperoni pizza, SliceOnBroadway.com. And listeners like you, support this show at Patreon.com slash AwesomeCast. Hey guys, it is the Awesome Cast episode 317 where we talk tech, get geeky. I'm Mike Sorg at Sorgatron on Twitter here in the Mayhem Studio in Pittsburgh, PA. And I got a wonderful crew digitally joining me here tonight uh, for a, 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 a fun time. Uh, first of all, let's start with uh, Kim Lyons joins us on the show. Kim, I don't even know what you do these days. <laughs> A lot of people say that to me. A little just a little back freelance writing for whoever will have me and keeping an eye, an eye on Uber and what they're up to in Steel City. That's right. And we, we, if anybody wants more about what she's into and what she likes in, in, here in town, we actually talked to her uh, a few months back on the awesome chat. Uh, so uh, go check that out. And also with us, Cynthia Klosky uh, of uh, Shift Collaborative. Again, not entirely sure what you do over there, but I'm sure it's amazing. <laughs> It is amazing. It's great to be here. So uh, at Shift, I'm a partner, which actually I guess doesn't really say very much, but we're a digital agency. You know, we do marketing, digital ads, real life ads, events, all sorts of good stuff. And I, I, I oversee aspects of that. That's right. I have some fun doing a, a little bit of a food project with uh, you guys currently so uh, it's, it's a lot of fun uh, but anyways uh, with us also the uh, our our replacement gadget gadget guru, guru for the week since chill is not here um, and 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 he's so <laughs> Ron I hope this doesn't come out as bad as I think it's going to he, he's, he's not up to he's so he's so the low rent gadget guru he can't even fix his lights by asking Siri that's right. I cannot ask Siri to turn on my lights. <laughs> he is the gadget guru that does not live in the future like Chilla does. He is planted firmly right here with the rest of us. Just living the dream. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, like I said, this is the Awesome Cast. You can check us out at awesomecast.net. Got some great stuff over there. You can subscribe to this show on video and audio versions, iTunes, Stitcher, Speaker, iHeartRadio, and then video versions over on the Facebook and the YouTube. Experimenting a little bit with Facebook Live this past week, and I, I, well, I, might, I might poke at it a little bit more here later this week, so let us know how you like that. Uh, just a little bit of awesome thing of the days. Uh, videos that we've been trying to do a little bit. Uh, and of course, the awesome chat has returned. Great discussion last week with uh, Buzzy and Nick of both the Epicast and Black Forge Coffee House doing some great things up there in the Allentown neighborhood. That's there. We're talking to MetaMesh that's also uh, working out of uh, 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 Allentown. MetaMesh, we talked about a, a long time ago when uh, Josh Lucas joined us to talk about Work Hard Pittsburgh like years ago. Uh, so it's it's cool to see how they're progressing as well. Um, also, uh, you can join us here live at our new home, live.awesomecast.net. That's right, a dedicated page because it's long overdue, uh, its own chat room. And you don't have to worry about those wrestling guys hanging out before the show and everything. Actually, you're going to hang out anyways. Uh, yeah. But you can go over there for any of our uh, streaming AwesomeCast events in the future. So again, live.awesomecast.net. Bookmark that, and we'll be embedding whatever the live stream is uh, for the evening. And also, a big thanks to our Patreon supporters, including uh, Mike Fedor, who uh, is joining us. Look, I got, I got, I got graphics for the the Patreon people this week. Uh, we're upgrading this. We're upgrading. That's where your money's gone. We made a graphic. Uh, <laughs> Five dollar level uh, at Mike Fedor show on the Twitters. He's doing some great content over there as well. Thank you so much for joining us. You can you can uh, support the show at patreon.com slash awesomecast and uh, make it a, a, a fan supported show as we uh, grow and do more awesome things. Some great awesome interviews uh, uh, getting lined up and scheduled as well for the other show. So let's get into oh, almost forgot. Another awesome place is riversedgepgh.com We're here live streaming on there. Well, no, we're not live. We're Our, our file of this show is live streaming over there 8 a.m. Uh, Thursday mornings after Funny Money. And, of course, we're going to be doing the pod crawl with them in the Millville area at uh, a, 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 on uh, September 30th. So uh, go over to riversedgepgh.com for more information on that and join the awesome cast live. All right, now let's get into our awesome things of the week. 
Um, let's ha let's let's start with Kraus because he just put Google Photo. Like, there's one Google Photo that he's excited about apparently. <laughs> No, this morning I took a picture. I saw something that I thought was interesting. It happens to be the fountain outside of the building I work in downtown. And later that afternoon, as you know, re well, I guess it's not recent now. It's four months or so ago. I left my beloved Microsoft phone by the wayside and switched over to my Android. And um, I got a notification that Google Photos had stylized one of my pictures. And so... I took a look at it, and I think I actually liked it more than I liked the actual original photo. Now, I've, I posted it to Facebook, and I've had two critics so far. Two friends of mine have posted. Chill is one of them, and th they had their own comments. To <laughs> wait, make, wait, wait, wait. I kind of like what Chill, it did. Chill's comment is, um, I think the bottom pick has too much noise. Tell Google to soften it. Yes. Yeah. Well, that you got. I guess you have to read my comment because I started. I started it by saying thanks, Google, and so of course he's <laughs> telling me to tell Google to soften it. So there you go. Yeah, I love it. I, I love uh, you know. Sometimes it gets a little funky and noisy like that. And I actually mm -hmm. saw this in my stream earlier, and it did catch my eye. And I'm like, why are the pictures like? You know, I'm not stopping to read anything on my feed apparently. Um, but uh, but no, yeah, it, it is pretty interesting. Now, have you had the? I had some photos, and it made a slideshow video and maybe a little bit of yes. video uploaded kind of out of that like i've i've just like said yeah that pretty much represents my day and i just like post it everywhere else yeah well mo more the only things i've really had so far that i've taken a bunch of pictures is we took a trip to geneva on the lake and so it kind of took all those pictures from that weekend and condensed it into a little movie that i've shared with like the wife and it's a couple of the people that were on the trip with us, but that's about it. Nothing that I've really posted anywhere. This was the first picture I thought, oh, that's kind of neat, you know? Mm -hmm. And I didn't really have much of an awesome thing this week, so <laughs> no, that's I guess great. it's a semi-awesome thing of the week. That's great. I, I, you know, Nokia is putting out a new phone they just announced today. Yeah? Yeah, I have, no, I have no, nothing else about it. I can't. It didn't even look like uh, yeah. Windows Phone when I looked at the picture, so... I, I don't well, know. What I heard a buddy of mine at the office. I didn't get to see the article yet because uh, I asked him for the link and he left before he could give it to me. He said he read somewhere that Microsoft has abandoned the all Windows phone. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what he's told me. So, it is. Yeah, Windows has, has uh, unveiled a new Nokia phone. And uh, yeah, it, it, this is what it looks like it's the Nokia 216 dual SIM. Uh, it is. Yeah, yeah. It says here about announcing that it's it's uh it is selling its feature phone business to FIH Mobile, uh, which is part of Foxconn. Uh, and uh, there you go. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah, a it's there actually, you go. It's actually a feature phone. It's not it's not like a smartphone. Apparently, it's it's just a straight feature phone. Like it's it's like like a slim candy bar phone. Yeah, Nokia did very well in that market for oh, yeah. a very, very, very long time. Oh yeah, we all had uh, Nokia phones with Snake on it, right? That was mm -hmm. our first uh, foray in the, into uh, cellular mobile gaming. So yes, it was. <laughs> all right, Cynthia, what is your awesome thing of the week? My awesome thing. Um, it's not a new thing to the rest of the world, maybe, but it's a new thing to me. I've been um, using my iPad Pro to. I'm like trying to make the change from being a paper-based person to being a, I don't know, bits-based person. And it's hard, you know, so I wanted to practice. And so I, I've been using this app, paper and pencil, and I've been like doing drawings and things to kind of, you know, get used to the feel of the pencil and things on it, on the screen. And it is amazingly fun. Like suddenly I understand this whole color book craze you know what i mean people coloring to kind of calm down at the end of the day so i've been doodling i, I i've been posting the things uh, every night on twitter the little drawings i've been doing i, I did a whole apple series Drawing apple yeah pretty cool and, uh, and it's been amazing it's been so fun so and this particular app um paper and pencil in addition to letting you do drawings where you can you know mix your colors you can use it as though it's a pencil, a pen, you know, watercolor, all that good stuff. But it also has some very cool little gadgety things where you can make diagrams. If you draw something roughly triangle shaped, it becomes a nice triangle. And so you can do workflow diagrams and other kinds of type and notes and things. So it's, it's pretty versatile those ways too. Mostly I'm using it for drawings, but you know, this way I feel like I can excuse it for work. 
And you're you're using a straight Apple pencil in, in conjunction with this, right? I am. I adore it. I love it. It's the best thing ever. That's awesome. That's awesome. So paper is an app that I know uh, I used a little bit, just just kind of playing around with it, uh, like on on the Apple three, or I'm sorry, the iPad three, uh, and it just you know wasn't really powerful enough to you know it just kind of lagged behind a little bit right by the time I got to it. Uh, but that's awesome that there is actually like a tool like I, I imagine it takes complete advantage of of the pencils features. It does. It um you know you've got you know sort of all the pressure and so on depending on which of the different devices you use. Like if you push hard with the pencil, it's going to do different than if you push hard with the watercolor pen, uh, brush or something else. So you've got, you know, it's nice that it's smart enough to, you know, sense the differences there. Um, but also, you know, pen uh, 53, I think is the name of the company that makes it. They sell their own stylus, uh, which I also purchased and thought that it would work best with it. And, and I don't like it nearly as well as I like the Apple. Mm -hmm. um, the it's Apple pen, you know, is, uh, it's more responsive. It like it's right back at you, whether you're using it even on this app that I, I would assume is supposed to be designed for this other tool. Well, I, I think it, it is probably more or less just a stylus, right? Like it's a really fancy wooden stylus from the looks of it here in there. In their, no, the end right? of it, oh, there's more to it. And also it's smart. Let me grab it out of here. It's smart. Um, but the one thing that's nicer about it, this is it right here. Um, and so it's got like the, the tip of it comes out, you charge it by pulling this thing out and pushing it in a USB. Mm -hmm. um, and this side of it has a feel too. So you can erase with more texture. So if you've synced this with the app and you're mm -hmm. using this with the app, you can do things like smudge with your finger. So there's certain things that probably would be better if you're to use this, if you're doing drawing. But I found that like even just, you know, doing a line, the, Apple one works like I can get more precise with it than I can with this. So, right. so would this take you down the so-called paperless road? Do you think? I don't know. I mean, why, why I'm doing this is that I, you know, I, for work, I, you know, I have meetings with clients and I take all these notes and then they sit in my little paper notebook and go nowhere. And I've got a whole team of people who need to know what happened at these meetings. And so my thought is, you know, I can either take my paper notebook and like hand it to someone in some sort of like a manager underling kind of a way and say, transcribe this for me. And that felt stupid. So I didn't want to do that. And so my goal instead with this is I don't even have to scan it. I just have to say, make this a PDF, upload it to Drive, and then everyone can see it if they would need to. So it's not so much that I need to be paperless, but that other people need to know what I know. Okay. And this is something we've, we've, we've tried solving before because uh, I know I got Missy, and, and again, it's not something that really caught on. I was saying, again, we all, we all we had were I, uh, older iPads, so maybe it just wasn't going to, and she's not going to use her phone for it. Uh, the one that had, like, the sensor that you put, like, on top of the uh, uh, iPad so that, you know, it would, it would take care of that. Um, I can't remember the name of it. We have the review over on the Awesome Cast page. Um, if you want to check that out, but, uh, it, it's nice that we have something that's kind of a little more straightforward, like, like, you know, the Apple pencil, uh, versus those other options. So, mm -hmm. so I saw something today that, uh, so the view find was something that, that we've had interesting, uh, we, we've been, I've been interested in for a while. I actually have a note and this was originally because it was on pre-order and I was kind of waiting. Uh, I have a note that I, I keep, I keep punting every month, uh, that says, do, should I get a view find yet? Uh, and the viewfind is uh, think of Google Glass, except it 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 is just basically a display that can connect to your camera or your smartphone and throw that image just in front of your face a little bit. Um, and uh, it, and I'm looking at it for maybe for uh, uh, my my videographers or doing video. Like I'm I was having problems uh, out in the middle of the sun. It's hard to see the LCD. Um, on, on a camera, but I still need to keep my head up because I have cars whizzing by me and I want to make sure that, you know, uh, I'm safe. Uh, so I, I thought this might be a pretty cool dis display thing. And, and, and we pontificated on the, uh, usefulness of Pokemon Go along with this. And it looks like Viewfind had the same idea because they released a video, <laughs> Viewfind plus, uh, Pokemon Go. Uh, and it, it's it's kind of a little product uh, video they have going on, and they do a little bit of yeah, this is what it's like to play Pokemon Go on here. So you can look around and just walk around and 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 see 
because I mean, if you have it in your pocket, you don't get to see like exactly what's popping up as far as um, what Pokemon or uh, what what uh, 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 Pokestops that you're coming across. Uh, so now it, it kind of makes it a little more interactive in your face uh, kind of uh, situation and safe. You get to look around. And it's not really obstructing your vision as much. Um, I, I know it kind of looks like because it's in front of his eyeball. But uh, I can tell you from Google Glass, like there really, really wasn't much peripheral um, adjustment there. Like I, I felt it's perfectly safe driving with it. So as long as this positions in a pretty similar way, and I like they have color ones now, so uh, you can uh, uh, match your Pokemon team, I guess. So um, that, that that that's a pretty cool um, um, use of that. Now, now this is kind of a, a side thing, but uh, uh, Cindy, you you had uh, uh, posted. Um, um, something else that that's coming up here. I, I know we've mentioned it before, but it's finally getting a release date. Yeah, so I, you know, I haven't. Um, I'm all okay there. I haven't entered the Pokemon Go world, but I have. I have um, people that I ask about it, and I ask them what was new there these days. And there's this um, device that I guess you say it's been like teased for a while, but finally is available for the low low price of thirty five dollars, and that's um, Pokemon Go Plus. And so I guess with this, you like you say, you've talked about it before. Um, it'll buzz as you're near things, and then you know to press a button. You can pick up stuff from all the stops, or you can like you know basically you know take a stab at grabbing whatever Pokemon critter is there beside you. And so it seems like it's like um, super convenient if you don't actually want to play Pokemon Go, but for some reason have to. I guess is my best interpretation. <laughs> like it's 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 for the. Eh, I'll play Pokemon. Um, no, it, it, it is interesting because it is like you get the you get your steps because I, I have to have my phone on and at least and in my pocket in order to walk my Charmander because that's a thing I can do now. Um, got my first candy from him today. Uh, <laughs> I see you laughing over there, Ron. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it, but it's a big battery drain, so it kind of like supplants that, so you don't have to have it, you know, kind of running at full, you know, full full clock on your on your phone and draining that out. Uh, so, but yeah, I, the whole, like you hit the button and it'll let you know if you're successful getting the Pokemon is kind of like, well, that kind of defeats, I like, I don't know how that works. You know, like, are they, are they expending my Pokeballs in order to do that? You know, my raspberry stash that has, I have way too many raspberries and my, 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 my bag keeps getting full and I can't get new stuff that actually is useful. Uh, but you know, can I sell my raspberries? Ron, do you want my raspberries? Sell potions. I sell them all. I keep ultras. That's it. Dump everything else. That's it. That's it. I see how it is. Um, but anyways, I don't I know. You, you can actually sell items in there? Yeah, you can sell them from the inventory slots. There's a, Or maybe it's not sell them, it's delete them. I don't know. But whatever oh. it is, I can get rid of a lot of stuff. All right. Hey, Rob, what, you. you might need to reconnect. We're getting a little bit of the, the weird uh, 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 the, 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 the siloning going on. All right. So... Um, but anyways, uh, no, I think it's, uh, I, I don't know if I'm as excited about this as I was, uh, Pokemon go on the Apple watch so much. Cause that actually, and actually I was playing with, uh, there are some Pokemon go, uh, pebble watch apps, like one that'll actually tell me like, uh, um, okay, you're, you're, you're fighting this thing. This is what's good against it. Like the whole, like, you know, water versus fire and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, that so I got a little like like kind of uh, Pokemon strategy guide on my wrist now. So we'll we'll see how it goes when I go up against my next gym. So I was battling a couple downtown today too. So all right, uh, wait, I get wait, Kim, I need to prepare for this next part and put on my media pass. Right? Here, let me tell you, I still have mine, even though I probably have like hundreds of those. It's not as cool when you have like a whole bunch of them, but I guess. Maybe for you. <laughs> well, I don't listen. I have like Comic Con media presses and, and stuff like Ooh. that, and uh, but uh, I have not the, until last week, and and we we had a you know because there was an embargo, so we 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 yeah. cut we cut the stream and we recorded a little bit for you guys at the end of the last show. My my initial impressions of uh, arriving in an Uber. I actually just found it. They just they put they did post the videos uh, that that I they had did for them over a Mashable uh, into a nice piece. So um, I, I, I know I, I shared that over the Awesome Cast Facebook page uh, group today, actually. So, but Kim, you got a ride in it too. Yeah, I did, and they let me actually get behind the wheel. Yes, which was like, yeah, I 
I, I expected to get in the car and there was going to be no one in the driver's seat. Like I, I didn't expect to be alone in the car, but I mean, you get in and there's someone in the driving driver's seat. And I was like, well, are you going to take me to the driverless car? Or is this, is this it? So obviously it's not quite safe enough for it to be totally driverless. And mm-hmm. I guess, you know, the whole, there's laws and stuff that you can't really have that yet. So, um, but yeah, they, when they told me they were going to let me drive it, I was, uh, terrified and also really excited of course I wanted to do it and uh so you sit behind the wheel and the funniest part to me was they have all this tech and it's all souped up and you've got a dashboard with you know all your uber stuff telling you whether you're in driver mode or driverless mode there's a big red kill switch so in case something goes wrong you have to go back to like headquarters so it's definitely like futuristic car even though it's still a Ford Focus but the, I had to manually adjust the side mirrors because they had souped up all the electronics so much that these side mirrors wouldn't like adjust from within the car. So I had to like manually adjust the mirrors, which I thought was a little bit amusing. But then once we're off, it was interesting because I guess I have heard, perhaps I'm a little bit of an aggressive driver. I grew up in Boston. That's where I learned to drive. So we're all mass holes there. So the way the car was driving was like really, really safe. Like it knew it was obviously a very pre pre planned route. Like Uber had done this route and mapped it out, uh, you know, well in advance of letting anyone get in the car. Um, and it knew when to slow down from 35 miles an hour to 25 miles an hour, you know, and it knew when to slow down for a stop sign. It knew when to take a, put the signal on to take a right. And so it was, it was like a super safe car to the point where it almost felt, you know, like a new driver, like when you first learn to drive, you don't know to ease your foot down on the brake, you know, you kind of stomp the brake. You don't know that you don't have to put your, um, you know, this turn signal on 10 minutes before you make your turn. It's doing those kinds of things, right? And then we came to a four-way stop sign and my car was taking a right and a car was approaching. We weren't going to cross paths, but as soon as the car senses, the Uber car senses a car in proximity, it slams on the brakes. And you can see that as one, that's a very super safe thing to do, but also if there had been someone behind me, that could have been a problem, right? That could have been a little bit problematic to, for because other drivers have expectations when you put your signal on. So it's like the car is still learning how to drive, you know, or learning how to be a driver, maybe, but it doesn't have the personality of a driver, you know, who has confidence and understands that other people can interpret the signals. And, you know, we're all kind of in this driving thing together. Um, and the other thing that I noticed, um, it held really close to the double yellow line in the middle of the road, closer than I do anyway which made me a little bit nervous, although there was a truck that kind of got over the line and he, it swerved pretty quickly to get out of the way. So it wasn't like it was dangerous, but it just was like one of those things that when you've been driving for a long time, you kind of expect the car to behave a certain way when you're behind the wheel. It's almost like being in a car with a driver that maybe you don't know that well or that, you know, you're not super confident in their driving abilities. Um, but it was very interesting, to say the least. I think it's a little bit ways away from where we're all going to be able to just hop in one any time. Uh, but it's definitely, it was really cool. I mean, as much as I sort of am skeptical of, you know, giant mega conglomerate companies, it was a really cool, you know, thing to be part of and to watch. And, you know, just to be in with all this insane technology and the lasers on the roof and the, <laughs> the whole thing. It was just really, I am in the future in a car. So it was very much my awesome thing of the week for sure. It sounds like you had a more adventurous drive than we did. We well, went. perhaps it was because I was really trying to butter up the two guys in the car with me, like the tech and the driver. Like I was trying to like, you know, get as much information out of them as I could without, you know, them having to be, you know, <laughs> taken in a back room and questioned or something because they give away secrets. But uh, it was interesting the whole time you're sitting there, the passenger seat, the, the technician who's got a laptop out and he's still mapping it. They're still sort of mapping the route and making sure, okay, Yes, it stopped at the stop sign that time, or you know, it it slowed down to 25 when it was in the 25 mile an hour zone. Um, so he was focused on that the entire time. Which, if you get to be one of the people who who hails an Uber and you get the driverless Uber, um, you know, possibility, there will be someone in the driver's seat. You're not going to have a driverless car completely, and there will be. I believe there's also going to be another technician and they're helping to map the route, and they're only doing it within a certain number of streets in the downtown, like right around the strip area near sort of the Uber Advanced Technology Center, which is in the strip. So it's not going to be for everyone. It's not going to be for, you know, just if you pick up the Uber app today, you're probably not going to be on the list because I think it's for people who have experienced Uber before who are a little bit more familiar with how it works. Um, 
but it's definitely, you can see the potential for sure. Um, and you can see the need for always having a driver in the driver's seat for sure. Because, you know, at one point we're stuck behind a truck that has his flashers on, you know, his, his, um, he's stopped, parked illegally. And the car doesn't know to go around this guy. The car's just waiting for him to move. So I had to take the wheel and kind of go around and, you know, not, I didn't put the guy off, but, you know, that's probably would have been within the realm of what a normal driver would do. But it's those kind of things where you're, the car is, it's really smart, but it's not, it's not experienced. You know, so it's it's really very much like when you're in driver of ed school and you're, you know, still learning how to like get used to being behind the wheel. Every article that I've read so far has cited an example about that, you know, getting stuck behind a double parked truck. It's always a double parked truck for some yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I, um, when I read though, all these articles, I'm like, did Uber like set that up so we would all get stuck behind that same double parked truck? We got an Uber plant. Over on Penn Avenue, but- right? Over on Penn Avenue? I no, it was on um, like 33rd as we were coming back to the okay. American Technology Center. So, I think it's just a, that the Strip District is the land of the double parked truck. Right, because no one knows where you're allowed <laughs> to park and not park, right? So, right. Or people are just jerks. Well, maybe, maybe. They're in a hurry. Is it, is it maybe still part of like the whole machine learning thing where the cars are literally a student driver? Because like what you described is what I experienced – teaching my children to drive yeah you know I would say that's that's pretty I, that's what i saw in my head as yeah. you were talking yeah. about it so yeah. is it is it partly that the, yeah, you know, I think it's it still learning it's teaching yeah it's learning how to drive learning how to be a driver you know because it knows how the mechanics of driving but it's learning to be a driver and i said to one of the uber people after the trip i said you know you're going to have to adapt each car for the city of them because it doesn't know how to take a pittsburgh left you know, and in Boston, there's, we don't uh, yield signs or like, you know, people ignore them completely. So how do you sort of train the car to be, have the personality of the city that it's in? You know, obviously New York drivers are a lot more aggressive. Um, I think it would be funny to try and teach the car how to do a Pittsburgh left, uh, you know, see how it would handle that. But, you know, it's, it's that thing with other drivers on the road. That's where your your danger is, right? That you they have expectations when you have your turn signal on, they have expectations you know, when you come to a stop sign, you come to a, a yellow light, what you're going to do, and maybe the car doesn't know those nuances or those sort of subtler points of, of driving and being an experienced driver. Certainly. It's even more true when you go from country to country. Like, people don't know what, why it is that I happen to have had this experience, but I've, I've had several people from Cuba drive me around, mm-hmm. and they all are the scariest drivers I've ever, ever, ever. <laughs> and so I don't know what it is about Cuba. And maybe it's not Cuba, maybe it's something else, but these women were all frightening. And oh. so it would be, I, so from country to country, perhaps it's even more um, different. Yeah, I would think so. And, you know, I, I would think the personalities, you know, of the country should, I don't know how you, how you work that into the algorithm. How do you teach the car that other than just experience and being in the city? And I wonder if the cars are that smart that they can, you know, learn the personality of the other drivers in the city. Cause I think that's going to be important. I mean, it's, it's, it's funny, but also, you know, there's expectations of other drivers on the road. Like you have, you know, when you come to a stop sign, you know, you can take a right turn on red. You know, there's in some cities, but not all cities. So I think knowing how other drivers drive is important to being on the road. Um, and I think that's probably something they're going to have to work into the algorithm or teach the cars how to adapt in that way. Until there's like a critical mass of these cars that we're all learning to we then we start to adapt to them maybe you know in my hometown up in butler um if two people come to a stop sign at roughly the same time very often one of the the person who really has the right of way will just sit there and wave the other person on <laughs> and like what if the, what if the the uber doesn't see that you know right oh, well on the other there's an interesting ethical argument too right that the uber the driverless car i don't want to keep saying uber because it's not just uber yeah that is developing this technology. They just happen to be the ones who are doing it in Pittsburgh. But the driverless car um, is programmed to protect itself and its passengers. What if you come up to a situation where you can either um, hit a family of four, run them over, or hit a brick wall? You know, the, the human driver picks a brick wall because you want to run over the family of four, but you know, does the car know to do that? Does the car say this is a greater risk to to the person inside the car into the car itself. You know, it's, it's sort of those ethical questions that, you know, those are very thorny. And I don't know how you teach, how you machine learn that uh, ethical question. You know, how do you deliberately put yourself in danger, you know, knowing that 
it's the possibility you could be seriously injured, but you don't want to run over people in the crosswalk. So, and what's interesting about that, that oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. The, 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 that kind of an ethical question, you know, comes up a lot when you think about, uh, or that, that com- there's a lot of experiments about it where if people are, you know, considering that and they're not involved in one way, they answer one way. And if you are involved, you answer a different way. And so you could be pissed in your car that the, that the car is doing the thing that you otherwise earlier in the day, you know, yeah. exactly thought was the right thing. Right, right. Yeah. So that's an interesting sort of side thing. I think that, you know, as these cars become more well-developed and Uber even has, you know, they have this sort of first gen, they're all Ford focused models and they have that obvious you know giant apparatus on the on the roof of the car there's no mistaking it for anything but an uber driverless car and then they have a deal with uh volvo as well where the the top apparatus is much sleeker and much more streamlined and it almost just looks like a roof rack that you would put bikes in but it's a little has some lights and some some lasers on it but it's much more streamlined and so when those start rolling out it will be interesting because you know as you're driving down the street in this thing people are staring and pointing and you know, it's definitely a conversation piece. And I wonder how you know distracting it is for other drivers to see on the road. Everyone's pulling out their phone and take a picture of you. So I think the real um, sort of integration will start happening when, uh, you know, the more streamlined versions of the cars start hitting the roads and being, you know, sort of they, they acclimate a little bit better than maybe the um, the current models. You know. Well, I think that though that, that big apparatus is a marketing tool, not just for the companies that are creating these things, but also for the technology. Sure. So the more that we see them and see, oh, that car is not killing anyone, sure. the, you know, the more <laughs> we'll all begin to trust it slowly. Yeah, yeah, that's that's very true. That's a very good point. Um, it definitely, you know, no one is going to mistake you in a driverless Uber for anything but a driverless Uber, you know. I, sure. I wonder sometimes if they built it a little bigger than they needed to for that reason. Yeah, well, you know, size matters and all that. <laughs> perhaps <laughs> make it a little more ostentatious. Yeah. The explanation when they did the media day was uh, that this, the current version that, that, that you see the pictures of everywhere is, is their desktop computer. The Volvo is going to be the laptop, like the, 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 you know, Svelter version of it. And they want to, the next one's going to be like the smartphone. Right. Yeah. So, um, right. And, and there's like, and even like the Volvo, I don't know if you got a chance to see the Volvo rendition yeah. that they have. Like it, it, it's, it's less cameras. But yeah. still does all the same stuff. Yeah, yeah, which is interesting. Like, uh, it's it's definitely uh, you can see it blending in much more easily, unless it has you know an Uber like logo on the side of it. You can definitely see that one blending into traffic much more easily than the current model. Mm-hmm. And, it's, and it felt like, it, at least uh, experiencing it from from taking the ride in it, like it seemed very. Um, it, it felt like a really spiffy cruise control. Right. Yes, you know, and that's really essentially at this point, that's really what it is, right? It's it's cruise control, it's controlling the just controlling a few more things than your pedals and your and your acceleration, it's controlling your signals and your steering wheel and your brakes. Um but yeah, that's essentially it's 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 you know advanced cruise control. Um at any time you can take over, you know, and start steering or hit the brake or hit the accelerator. Um but yeah, it was it it was very much that feeling. And then I was talking to the guys like do people like want to just start texting and let the car drive? Because I see that sort of, you know, the anti-texting while driving, uh, you know, rules are, you know, sort of go by the wayside as we become, you know, more, uh, you, these become used more and people will just, you know, not pay attention to the road as much as we're going to have that whole problem again where people aren't paying attention. So, because you do have to keep an eye on the road, obviously, you're, you're still, you know, have to be available. It's not like you can just conk out and sleep you know, while the car drives you around, at least not yet. Right. Right. Oh, it'll, it'll be interesting. So, so did you, I got, I got one more question. So yeah. did you, were you very hands on the wheel? Like, like the, uh-huh. like the Uber drivers were? Exactly. Or? Well, I had my hands like on, resting on the bottom of the wheel. And at one point the guy was like, can you actually put your hands more on? Cause I was trying to like keep them in my lap and not have them on the wheel at all. But the guy was like, can you put them just, just rest them on the wheel. It would make us feel better. <laughs> <laughs> see, see, see my report. <laughs> The reporter I was with just like, yeah, put them in her lap going up uh, that road by, by the Heinz factory. And I'm yeah. just like, all right, I guess we're good with this. Uh, <laughs> I'll be recorded anyway, so if anything goes wrong, at least there's evidence. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there was that too. Because I was like, I'm rolling this whole time. I just don't even, we're just rolling with this. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, it was it was really interesting. So, um, well, we'll see how it goes. I, I, love, I love that uh, uh, Pittsburgh 
I was selling, uh, ironically, a Uber driver yesterday because they had the Steelers deal since they won. Yeah. He got a discount yesterday. Um, I was like, I love Pittsburgh becoming like 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 San Francisco a little bit. That we got our driverless cars here. Uh, I can get my groceries delivered in like like twenty minutes to my door. You know, like we're getting a lot of that happening. You know, here. Mm-hmm. You know we're getting yeah. to see a lot of that advantage. So, really cool. All right. Well, you know what uh, uh, is not being delivered to me by driverless uh, uh, cars just yet? Slice on Broadway. Our good friends feeding the podcast, uh, uh, supporting Pittsburgh podcasting with the perfect pepperoni pizza. Uh, check them out there over at sliceonbroadway.com. Three locations. I was just hanging out last week. Actually uh, went down there for a wrestling show down at Stage AE. And, uh, of course, we had to hang out over at uh, Slice on Broadway. Over there at PNC Park. And you can also check out their other locations here in Beachview. Beachview is open, guys. There's no more construction. Well, at least in Beachview. There's everywhere else still. The train's going to be back soon. So it's going to be back next week. I, I missed my train. I, hearing <laughs> my train from my bedroom is, was used to be the most soothing thing. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, but I'm three blocks away, so it's still at the soothing yeah. level. Um, but that, and of course, uh, they're down on the main street in Carnegie, PA. Uh, check them out. Uh, they, they've been supporting the show for for a while now, uh, fueling the podcast night here at uh, Sorgatron Media and Mayhem Mayhem Studios here in Pittsburgh. So hit up PGH underscore Slice on the Twitter, Slice on Broadway on the Facebook and the Instagram. All right, so let's see what else we got there. Let's go around the horn. Uh, Cindy, what do you want to talk about next? I would like to talk about the, the terror that I have. Well, it's not really terror, but, um, so Comcast says they're going to have cell phone service. I saw that. <laughs> I did that was my reaction as well. I was like, oh, okay. I mean, I mean, will, will, will that be a four play bundle? You know, they've got these three way bundles now. Can I do that instead of the, you know, if the only reason I would do it is if it gave me a discount, but even then I think their service on everything else is so poor. It's very hard for me to imagine wanting to use them. I rely on my cell phone for everything. It's the worst idea I can imagine. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's not like your cable TV, right? Where you can, you can, you need it, but if it goes out, it's not going to, you know, sort of cripple your day. Whereas if your phone isn't working and you can't get a hold of a tech or someone, you know, to answer your phone, that's a pretty big risk to take with a company that eh, may not have the greatest track record. So that's, that's my kind of thinking on it. But at the same time, you know, it turns out that there are other cable providers in the country that are not Comcast. And so what I wonder is if, you know, some of the local ones, like I, um, I recommend very highly the Armstrong group of companies up, up there, you know, Butler Way and, other parts of our of our fine region, um, and they're a terrific company now. So, does this open the door for them to offer cell phone service? Because if it does, I would I would go for that in a heartbeat. I would believe in that. So maybe if this this is just maybe the first of because they're the big gorilla. If Comcast can do this, then maybe some of the other uh, cable providers will be able to as well. This looks like it's going to be fairly regional to where Comcast is for their, their cable customers, because it's saying it's going to be a, a, an interesting hybrid. Uh, sounds a little bit like the um, Google Fi program, where uh, it, it's going to be a mix of, of the cellular towers and, and uh, uh, you know, actually, you know, like you're already sharing, you know, a little bit of your internet, uh, uh, you know, with, through the routers, and anybody can log in if you, if you have the newer Xfinity routers. Uh, it looks like it's going to take that on. It's basically going to work off of the Wi-Fi coming from people's homes. Um, so... Like I don't think it's going to be a direct competitor. It's just kind of the, one of those interesting. Uh, well, I, I wonder. You know, we think of it. You know, we maybe you know the group of us here tend to be among the people who travel from city to city a lot. You know, um, or you know, go back to the home. You know, the homeland of Boston, if you're Kim. But you know, I think there are just there's a, a lot of population that really doesn't travel very far from from home, and so it would be a better fit for folks like that, where you know you're almost all the time you're within, you know, almost, you know, spitting distance of your house. So it's a, it, it, it makes sense to me that that's their target market. Yeah. 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 It's, it, it'd be interesting if, they, if they're really going to kind of lean on this Wi-Fi thing, like there's gotta be, there's, it's gotta be a pretty tremendous saturation point in, and the handoffs between Wi-Fi's if you're like driving in a car or riding in a car, maybe, or in a bus or <laughs> something like that. Like, I, I don't know how, how useful that's going to be. Uh, maybe, maybe it's just going to roam on everything else. 
in related news, because they do mention it here, uh, DirecTV, I'm sorry, AT&T, stop making me try to sign up for DirecTV. Seriously. Seriously, <laughs> guys. It's getting ridiculous. Um, I get like three things a week from these guys. So the paper. Wow. Uh, but anyways, uh, yeah, it, it, it's interesting. I, I guess, I guess, in the long run, it is good to have another big cell phone service come up. You know, more competition, always more, better. More competition is always better, which is weird. Yeah. You know, with Comcast in the equation. But there you go. All right, uh, let's go around. around. Kraus, yeah, yeah, you got a couple in here. What do you want to talk about? He's on the mute. He's on the mute. I think you're muted. No, something else is going on there. Oh dear. Uh-oh. Uh oh. Uh, turn off and turn it back on again. Uh oh. I can jump in while he's resetting. Oh, yeah, he's yeah. Go, go ahead. So I went last week to the online news association conference in Denver, Colorado, which was beautiful because Denver is just a beautiful city. And it was really fascinating because this is a group of, you know, this is journalists who are all online focused, online oriented, really into the tech, you know, every tech gadget you can possibly think of. And there was a lot of discussion about how virtual reality and augmented reality could be and will be used for news reporting, you know, in the future. And so everyone's walking around kind of testing out, you know, CNN's virtual reality goggles and talking about using chatbots and, um, you know, artificial intelligence to do news gathering and do news reporting. So it was really interesting to see all the different things that people are, you know, considering virtual reality for. It's not just, you know, playing World of Warcraft and, you know, staying up till four in the morning gaming, which is also fine, but but there's real world implications for, you know, recreating um, a situation, um, you know, that to show, instead of taking a video or showing like a reenactment or, or a pie chart or something, you can actually use some virtual reality to recreate a situation, you know, whether it's a you know a crime scene or whether it's an event that happened. Um, and so it was really interesting just to hear all the different ways that people are thinking about using not just virtual reality, but augmented reality so that it's, you're, you're actually changing the experience some of the person viewing it than the original experience. So that was actually um, very, I was definitely in the future there in Denver last week. And it was really a very cool, just to cool to see that there's so many people in journalism trying to figure out this brave new world, you know, that we're not, you know, sort of rolling over and, and, and dying, that there's a lot of potential for all this technology and, and, you know, really cool things going on. Smart people trying to figure out, you know, how do you make the news experience better? How do you make it so that people want to, you know, listen to your podcast or watch your, you know, your video or get immersed in your interactive um, so virtual reality and augmented reality be very, very big parts of news media going forward if this conference is any indication. So, so does this seem like it, it, it is kind of moving, like kind of the storytelling focus from from just telling how how things yeah, are to just, more showing? It's definitely it. more of a show instead yeah. of just tell. But I think it's, it's going to be a combination. It's not just going to be, hey, here's a video, sit passively and watch it. It's going to allow for more interaction and more... Um, reaction, you know, for readers and listeners and viewers, they'll be able to feel more part of the news experience. And, you know, whether or not people want that, I think remains to be seen how involved they want to get in, in you know, in being placed in the middle of a crime scene, you know, virtual reality uh, scenario. Um, and I think the other problem is, one, the headsets are still a little bit clunky to wear. So how do you get past that? user experience right which is not you know unique to journalism but also the whole idea of um what are the ethical concerns behind it what are the ethical you know there's a whole host of you know potential um problems when reporting the news in a way that is so could be potentially so visceral and so you know in your face that it may change the actual experience for the user you know how are we how do we want people to absorb the news and absorb journalism I think it's really visceral, is, visceral is exactly the word I was thinking of when you were talking about that. And that, you know, fact checking is already so hard. Yeah. And fact checking a world like, you know, I believe this is true because I was there. Well, you weren't, right. you weren't there. You were in a recreation of it. Right. In such and such a case, you know, you think of all the cops type shows. Well, I, I saw him, he, he did this. Well, you didn't really see it. Yeah. yeah. You saw the edited version of the video that they put together. You weren't actually there. So, yeah. 
and it is interesting, you know, it, when you're you're showing these experiences with virtual reality, it was actually part of the discussion. We had a pod camp um, about about 360 and VR because we we had a uh, uh, Chris Chris Whitlatch had actually brought the Planned Parenthood uh, thing, and we talked about how parts of it were acted, and it's it's a 360 video, so you get to turn your your head in you know around all the actors basically. Mm-hmm. And it was supposed to be the experience of, you know, what it's like to, to go to, a, for the person going to uh, Planned Parenthood. Uh, uh, and and when it gets to the point where, like, they're getting yelled at, that turns into a CG animation. And it's very, like, you know, it looks like a video game at that point, right? And we're like, that seems like an interesting choice. Why do we, why do we, we, we skip to that? And it is that idea of, you know, you can't show something too extreme especially something like a nonprofit that is trying to um mm-hmm. educate and not scare you know what i mean yeah, not entertain right and not entertain but so there's like a line apparently of you know you need to bring them to the edge of it without uh shocking them basically uh mm-hmm. to get the, the desired fa- effect as of course a, a nonprofit uh wants to in, in, in the education hopefully fundraising most likely right um and I, I'd imagine the news side, I would think, needs to be along the same 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 trajectory as that, right? Yeah, I mean, I would think so. And just sort of think of all the possibilities. You know, you don't put um, course language, you know, in a newspaper. There's there's standards and guidelines. So what are the standards and, and guidelines going to be for virtual reality? I mean, are you going to show, you know, a scene where there's a you know there's a murder or if there's you know a violent situation? How much of that do you show? How much of that do you, you know, refrain from showing? And then how, who chooses? You know, those are, those are the, uh, the questions that newsrooms will have to sort of grapple with. You know, because I, it, the one um, speaker I was listening to who was very, just kind of controversial about some of the things she was talking about, but um, she was saying, you know, how do we ensure that we don't go down the path of desensitizing people to these experiences and to this level of violence? If you're really in real world, you know, recreated, but still based on very real violence. How do people, when you're immersed in it, it's less shocking the more you're immersed in it, right? So how do you how do you draw that line, or how do you fi- figure out how, how do you avoid that? And maybe you can't, um, but keeping people so that it's still shocking to them. It should be shocking to see something that violent, right? So how do you how do you ensure that you're not crossing the line and making it so that it seems commonplace or it seems sort of mundane, right? Or on the other side of things, you could um, be like London Fashion Week, where they have you do augmented reality over near naked models that they had in the store window <laughs> as basically living man- mannequins. Uh, this caught my attention this week for obvious reasons. Uh, so, but hey, it's uh, it's something different than trying to catch your Pokemon, right? Uh, yeah. So, Ron, are you back with us? I hope so. Yeah. Welcome back to okay. land to land of the Thanks. podcast. I don't know what happened there. So, how is this? And I might have missed part of the conversation while I was working on the headset. But since I didn't have a chance to talk about it, I need to ask. So, why are we recreating news? Wouldn't this just take the VR camera and replace, you know, the guy standing with the camera and the reporter reporting? It could be that person. All at one time. Yeah, potentially. I mean, potentially that could be a situation eventually when the virtual reality, you know, um, technology is, is good enough to yeah. broadcast in the club. But you know, obviously, speaking of a situation where you know a lot of times as a reporter, you're coming to a story after the things have happened, and you're recreating it by talking to witnesses and talking to the police okay. and talking to. So this would be they use an example of a situation where there's a story of a guy who was. Um, waiting in line outside a homeless shelter on a very hot day to get in and they cut off, there was too many people so that he was not going to be allowed to get in and he fainted and collapsed on the sidewalk and I think he actually died. Um, and so, you know, obviously the reporter who's reporting on this wasn't at the scene. So how right. do you recreate this? She could have written a story and talked to witnesses, probably taken a photo of, you know, the building where it happened or talked to some people there. But they went to this, uh, the step of recreating in virtual reality. So it looked like The Sims, you know, right outside the set, this building. And they actually you know, recreated the scene as it was told to them. They actually had some audio that they, from the actual incident that they, they used to you know, sort of augment it. But you, you could see that as a situation where, you know, at what point do we stop showing this? Because the, the guy yeah. collapses on the sidewalk and has a seizure. So 
you know, if you're going to recreate an event to help people understand what happened more fully than just the written word or photographs after the fact, you can see the sort of potential for that. Any okay. implications for how much do you show? You know, how much do you recreate? Okay, I understand that now. Uh, that's I missed that part of the conversation. So that's good, uh, Ron. Let's bring it around here. Uh, you have an article in here that actually kind of pairs nicely with our Uber conversation earlier with Lyft. Yep, and that's where I was trying to go when my phone, when my headset wasn't working. <laughs> um, Lyft has a tw- It's a. I guess it's a twenty or twenty four. What do they said? It was. Um, well, it was part of the company's 10-year plan that basically private car ownership is going to go away. And I have to be honest with you, I am all on board for this. Mm-hmm. I own a car that sits on my side street, and it's lucky if it moves once a week. You know, my wife drives to work every day. I take the Port Authority, thank you, for the buses. And for me owning that car, it probably costs me more money per year than I actually get back from it. So having the idea of having this vehicle that I could just pull out my phone and say, you know what, tomorrow at 10 o'clock, I'm going to need a car for three hours. And it shows up at my front door and takes me where I need to go. And then when I get home, it drives away. Sign me up. Yeah. You know, I I stepped towards this today, Ron. I, you did? Uh, I well, I I had we I had a scheduling thing come up, and I have a second car. You you've been here. You see, I have the the yep. second car that's been sitting there, and it has no uh, official license plate or anything like that. And and and, and it needs a new starter. And I was like, ah, yeah, you know, you know, let's save a couple bucks on the insurance while we're waiting. And it just never got back around to it, right? And and it's a car that's paid off, and I own it, right? And, and yeah, I haven't, but too. but it still costs X amount to get it onto the road and stay on the road legally, right? Yep. So so again, like something came up, and uh, and, and and I realized like like two days in advance, like like oh, oh, we're doing this in two days, okay? Uh, and 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 oh, you, you the, the cars are involved in something else, right? Uh, so I I took the Port Authority downtown today. And got myself a zip card. I love zip cards. Yeah. I mean, I love the concept of zip card. I, lo- I use it all the time. I will say their customer service is sometimes a little spotty. Uh huh. Um, but yeah, I, we use zip car all the time because we don't have a second car. So, so I, I feel slightly bamboozled because there's a okay. zip car lives here sign at the top of the hill three blocks away where everything else is. Thank you. It does not have a zip car yet. Yes. Well, it was for a while because we use that one all the time because we don't live that far from Beachview. Right. I think during construction, they moved the car um, because it was hard to get in out of that lot where it was. Okay. Um, It was there. Um, It was there for months. It was super convenient. I only had to get to Beachview um, instead of going all the way downtown. But I don't, that's one big complaint we always have about zip cars. You know, we use that car frequently. It would have been nice to have a heads up that, hey, we're moving this car. It's not going to be available anymore. So that's one of the things I think, you know, they don't do a great job communicating with customers until there's a problem. Um, so that would be my sort of only caveat about using Zipcar. We have found it to be a great savings because the cost of your membership includes gas, includes maintenance, and includes, you know, like a parking pass if there's a garage that it's parked in. Um, so it's very convenient. We use it a lot more in Boston um, because there were just more Zipcars there. And when I was in Denver this past weekend, um, you know, I wanted to, I kind of blew off the last half day of the conference and I wanted to explore Denver, but I had flown there. I wasn't going to rent a car just to like drive around for an afternoon. So I got a zip car there. So it's, it's good for that kind of short, you know, if you want to just go to the grocery store, you just want to, you know, you have a quick trip. You don't really want to go downtown and pay for parking. I say, I would say the drawbacks are you have to return the car to the same place where you pick it up. And you know, you're at the end of the day, you're, you're relying on other people. It's, it's really car sharing. So you're relying on other people to make sure there's gas in the car, to return on time, you know, to not wreck into a wall before you have, you know, before you get your turn. So there's always those sort of minor snafus that will, will pop up. Um, and I think, you know, zip car could be a little bit more responsive as far as, you know, getting problems solved or helping you when there's a crisis. Uh, but I think overall, I, I recommend the model. I recommend the idea. Um, I wish we had more than one car sharing company in Pittsburgh. 
Right. Um, it would be nice if we could have a little competition there. So I think it might improve Zipcar. It even seems competitive. And that, I've been leaning toward um, this whole thing. I have a very elderly car. <laughs> debating whether I <laughs> Don't we all? <laughs> the poor old thing. It's adorable, but it's old. So, um, uh, so I've been leaning toward this whole Zipcar thing because I drive less and less. You know, I can take the bus to work. I can walk to work. And then if I need to go to a client thing, sometimes I even ride with just a, a coworker. Yeah. But there are times when I need to get up to Butler. So, um, but you said that they cover gas and yet the other person has to put the gas in. So what's... what's there's, there's a card. So there's like a little card in the car and it charges to, you know, you, you swipe it at the gas pump just like you would with a regular credit card. And then you, but you're responsible for making sure the car has gas in it, but you don't have to pay for the gas yourself. Okay. Um, and, yep. you know, there's rules about, so if I, if I bring a car back... <laughs> And for the next person, it's only got a quarter tank of gas, you know, then I get fined. So there's, there's, there's incentive to make sure you don't, you know. And, and, and even their role is please at least have a quarter tank of gas, yeah. basically. Yeah. So, uh, it, it, yeah, it looks interesting. And, you, you know, I was just thinking about this. You know what put Zipcar in the back of my head that really timed out well for this? I saw the Zipcar get in a fender bender uh, about <laughs> a week and a half ago down in the Strip. Uh, so <laughs> of course it was emblazoned and it pulled out and uh, it's like man I hope they paid for their accident insurance and I yeah. did and I did yeah. when I signed up. <laughs> I did. Yeah. You say it was while you were in the autonomous vehicle. No 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 no. It was it was actually for <laughs> another event I was working in the strip uh, a couple Sundays ago. Uh, but uh, um, like a car, what did they call it? The, where the cars hit each other? Um, demolition derby between Uber and Zipcar, battling it out there. <laughs> Would it be hilarious if, if the if the driver's car hit the Zipcar, or vice versa? Just like like it just really comes down, you know, really comes down. But yeah, yeah, imagine that lawsuit. I mean, who wants to? <laughs> yeah, seriously. Pay that insurance claim. Seriously, um, yeah, I, I, I think I think uh, all of us are in are in, in very fortunate uh, uh, inner city kind of situations here. Where yeah. we do have, uh, 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 you know, depending on where you live, pretty decent uh, port authority, uh, Zip, Lyft, I'm sorry, Zip Car, Lyft, Uber, and and hell, even the Z Trip seems half decent. I haven't used it, but but it sounds like they're doing a lot there to make that a lot easier to use too, which is basically our yellow cap. So yeah, there's there's a lot less reason to get your car on the road, and and I'm I'm trying to embrace that even more so. Um, and, uh, and we'll, and we'll see. And it's nice to have the, that choice because I say, okay, who's got, who's got a coupon code because the Steelers won, uh, this time. Uh, yeah, we'll try Uber again. Uh, <laughs> so you get to get to play, play that a little bit too. So, Hey, they're doing it on their end. I I've seen, I've seen a Lyft driver, uh, end their drive with me and, and, and boot up the Uber app to look for oh, the yeah. next drive. It, and yeah, have both stickers. Have two, two apps going at once. Yep. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Well, guys, it's time for us to uh, cut out of here. Uh, Ron, I know there is an event coming up with some news that you had marked. Uh, ah, yes, the Google uh, phone launch. Well, the supposed—I guess they're calling going to call it the Pixel. That's the latest rumor. So, October fourth, we should be seeing some new devices from Google. Um, it, it's kind of interesting the little video that they did. I love this the come and get your love was the song in the background. I just thought it was great. Um, very well done little piece of video there. And so it'll be interesting to see what they come up with. Um, one of the things I would say as a person who works with cell phones on a daily basis, um, like Apple Android is the most direct source to Android and which means you get the monthly, daily, weekly updates directly from them without having to go through the carriers like some of the others like uh, LG and uh, Samsung, you know, they're dependent on the carriers to push those updates out. So it's always better to get as close to the source as you can. That's, That's my right. statement. And we started this uh, I think last week but uh, stories we did not get to uh, Doug Durda let us know uh, let me know about uh, Google Trips is uh, an app you get for uh, both platforms that you can actually like, like if you're in inbox or Gmail that pulls together all your uh, uh, plane and hotel info and it'll give you actually download maps. If you're going to a different country, uh, just in time for me to try it out in Thailand in a couple months. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, GoPros eight hero five cameras are cloud connected and natively waterproof. I'm excited for that. Also the drone that they have going along with that. You can attach to a GoPro to GoPro themselves are putting it out. A jet powered hoverboard is real. And yes, it's been crashed over on the verge. We talked about that on my uh, awesome things of the day over on the Facebook Live. So check that out over on the Facebook page. 
Uh, an anti Sim City game challenges players to make money in real estate among racial and historical dynamics. Wow, that's awesome, Sydney. <laughs> yes. uh, is this the one where where the gamers beat like some like like planners to 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 solve a problem? Yeah. Yeah, I think or maybe no, no. There, there was another one I think about, um, like genomes or something like that 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 came out this week. So I don't know. This, uh, this is a little bit older. It's a CMU um, associate professor or researcher, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, also, Twitter's character count rules have changed. Uh, I know at replies and like stuff like pictures, I think, and are, are getting rolled into there. So we'll play around with that and see if that actually helps us or not. And uh, half of the U.S. smartphone users download no apps, according to a report uh, that you put in here as well. I, I can believe that because I once somebody wanted to put Square on their phone, I'm like, cool. Um, hey, your Google Play Store isn't set up. How long have you had this phone? Six months. Oh, oh, uh, yeah, I guess so. Um, yeah. Sorry. Like 13 percent of the users of, of smartphones download all the apps. So we are the 13%. We are. We are the 13%. <laughs> well, uh, and of course, please check out everything else. Uh, we have, uh, like I said, awesome chats. The pod crawl is coming up. We're doing a Sorgatron Media Coffee uh, up at Work Hard Pittsburgh here on October 1st. And uh, and uh, we're actually doing an N64 uh, a No Mercy video game tournament uh, as, as part of Wrestling Mayhem Show with our friends looking for group over in Brookline. Lots of events, lots of awesome stuff. I'm going to be talking intro to podcasting tomorrow night. That's why I need a zip car so I can get to that on time. I'll actually probably take the zip car back to its home downtown and take a, take a lift to the thing so I can make it on time. Wow. I'm going to, we are going to connect all the dots. I'll take the port authority to go down and get the car. And and I so this will go. Figure a way to work an airplane into this scenario. You would, I think, hit all possible modes of transportation. There, that's that's some other time. I've done enough airplaning for this year. Um, but uh, anyways, uh, so go check out all the events. Um, I'll list it over the Facebook page um, under events as well. Thank you so much, Kim Lyons. Where can people find you? You can find me usually on Twitter, unfortunately, or fortunately, maybe on uh, social Kimly. Usually, you can find me there, or I'll find you there. Awesome. Cynthia Klosky. I also am on Twitter. I'm Cynthia Klosky on Twitter. Can I say something just real quick that, that we're hiring? Is it okay to mention that? My company, Shift, is hiring a web developer and some other kind of roles. So visit our website and, and work with us. There you go. There you go. And Ron Krause, Crazy Kraus on the Twitter. That's me. Also, Ron Krause on Facebook, if anybody cares that much. Check out his uh, Google photo and then also critique it like Chilla did. Exactly. I'm over at Sorgatron on the Twitter, Sorgatron.com. Sorgatronmedia.com wants to do just about everything that we're doing these days, one way or another. Uh, and follow me on those things and get pictures of uh, uh, stuff we're getting into over on the Instagram, Sorgatron. Sorgatron everywhere on whatever social media is worth being on. Um, I probably was that on Flirt back in the day as well. Thank you, everybody. Awesomecast.net, patreon.com slash awesomecast. Thank you to our awesome chat room, the new awesome chat room at live.awesomecast.net every Tuesday at 7 p.m. You have been our awesome audience. Have an awesome week. This show is a member of the Sorgatron Media Podcast Network. Find out more at sorgatronmedia.com.